the first history video it's recording now. And there's your audience there. And um, what topic do you want to start with? I'm just going to start with Erasmus. Because Erasmus was the beginning, really, of the modern era that we call uh, today, today's way of looking at things. He, and he had other important uh, lessons for us because he was the second illegitimate child and his, his, they didn't think that didn't bother them even though his mother, Roger Gerard, was a priest and his mother, his father, Roger Gerard, was a priest and his mother was a physician's daughter but he still held a good place in society, they didn't matter he, as a schoolboy, Erasmus was very clever, but when his parents died, both the parents died, he was still of an important family and his guardian sent him to be educated by a new idea and these were very much pertinent to us. They were called the Brethren of the Common Life and what was different about those is this is the first time we really hear of not monastic people teaching and having a religious institution. The, that doesn't mean, mind you, that his school life with the brothers, brethren of the common life uh, were very happy for him. Erasmus would remember the school only for severe discipline he intended. And this discipline was intended to teach humility by breaking a boy's spirit. Now that is very opposite to our view of teaching children, where we want them to have self, good self-esteem. But in those days, the church had got to this stage of thinking that man was evil, and he was born evil. And a lot of that undermines how you will live your life. If you think man is especially good, you will have a more optimistic outlook. Uh, outlook. But if you think man is evil, he's going to destroy the planet and he's a plague on the planet and he's the cause of all our problems. You'll, that is a, a, what's called a Hobbesian view of life. Well now, Erasmus did not like the Christ, brothers of the Christ, brethren of the common life. But he, he, he had very little choice. All you could do in those days if you were brought up by the brethren of the common life was to become a monk. So both him and his brother entered monasteries. Erasmus chose the Augustan canons regular uh, and he stayed with them for about seven years. He, he, he was a great classical uh, student. Now that might mean much to us, but all in the Dark Ages, most of the learning of the Greeks and the Romans had been lost. And when this period we are studying is called Renaissance, it means rebirth. So what they were rebirthing was Roman and classical, uh, the Odyssey and the Cicero and the old classical um, writers. What was taught in the universities before the Renaissance was all the fathers of the church and scholastic theology which Erasmus made the break away from. He said, all learning, Erasmus said, all learning is secular learning. And that was pertinent to moral concerns. He's the first of us. We would now very much say it's secular. It's not, it shouldn't be religious. It shouldn't be denominated. It should be secular. And in America, they, they want in our day and age, not obviously in Erasmus' day and age, but in uh, our day and age, they won't allow you to wear religious symbols in in uh, schools. You can't even wear a crucifix. There was a great film where they made a complaint that they weren't allowed to build a crib in the school. He uh, said monasticism is not a piety. Mer uh, he, after seven years as a monk, he was delighted to get away and he was made he happy to escape the monastery. He accepted the post as Latin secretary to the influential Bishop of Cambrai. Very important to Erasmus was he sailed for England in 1505. He was hoping to get support for his studies. 
Instead, when he got to England, he found an opportunity to travel to Italy. This was the land of promise for the northern humanists. He was a humanist. He was of the northern Renaissance. And the Renaissance had started in Italy. So he w went there and he was acted as tutor to the sons of the future Henry VIII's physician. Uh, the party arrived in the university town of Bologna at the time to witness the triumphal entry of the warrior Pope Julius II. He arrived in Rome on his horse with the, all his soldiers. He came as the head of a conquering army. We don't really see our popes have moved a long way from that now. This really annoyed Erasmus and he has, he brought out a satirical, I suppose a Twitter-like account, called Julius Exclusus is Jealous. Now that's Latin. It means Julius excluded from heaven. And uh, he denied that he wrote this, giving out about Julius, but in later years it was accepted that he wrote this. In Venice, Erasmus was welcomed by the printing house and he, they printed a lot of his stuff. Now, he, one of his first uh, important works was Adagia. Now, that's A-D-A-G-I-A. -A -A. It's really a Latin word. It means proverbs. It means old sayings. He collected together all the old sayings. And it, one of them it called for, it's called for Dutch years. And it shows that he wasn't over enamoured with the carry-on of the Italian Renaissance. It hints that he was not an uncritical admirer of sophisticated Italy with its theatrical sermons and its scholars who doubted, these scholars doubted the immorality, immortality of the soul. So he wanted his writing to be for honest and unassuming Dutch ears. Erasmus had a great faith in the power of education. He believed that it is what one reads is what makes a man, that he becomes what he reads. And he very much felt that you could educate anybody to be better than they are. He, Erasmus thus said, it was almost true to say, believe that what one is is what one reads. Thus, he, the humane letters of classical and Christian antiquity, those letters, like the letters in Paul and that, ha, would have a beneficial effect on the mind. He was against the classical study of debate and moral theology and also the romantic literature of King Arthur. He calls them the vengeful amour bred into young aristocrats by chivalric literature. The stupid, and he called them, now I'm not saying them, he called them the stupid and tyrannical fables of King Arthur. Now, those fables shaped the attitude of the men of the time that they thought it was great to be noble and to be a warrior was great. And then you went and you defended the weak, they are being the ladies, of course. You helped the damsel in distress. And you helped all the poor and the ignorant. And that made you, or, or the weak and those who beg. And that gave you honour and chivalry. And the chivalry code was very high. So if you were insulted or your honour was impugned, you had to go off and fight a duel to kill the people. We have moved a long way from that. And being a warrior is now no longer seen as the best example of manhood. Now men can cry and write poetry and wear nail varnish and things of the poor. The chivalry knights of the, of the Middle Ages would have thought impossible. Uh, he wrote um, one of his most famous books. The most famous book that has come down from... Um, Erasmus. Yes, from Erasmus' writing is called Embrace of Folly. Wow. Um, he has, by this stage, Erasmus' writing has taken on a very satirical tone. He was on his way, across the Alps on his way back to England, and this was written in St. Thomas More's house. He was a great friend of St. Thomas More's house. These are all the new educators. It expressed a very different mood. This, the, this time, the earnest scholar saw that his own effort, along with everybody else's, was bathed in satire and irony, which foolish passion people were moved by their palate. He said even the wise man must play the fool if he wishes to beget 
a child. Now, Erasmus didn't do much begetting of children. Little is known of Erasmus's long stay in England except he lectured at Cambridge and uh, he worked on scholarly projects. He went to Basel to prepare a new edition of the Adagia. They were the proverbs he pulled together. In this and in other works of about the same time, Erasmus shows a new boldness. And this new boldness this is going to lead the way for the Reformation. Uh, Erasmus said, I laid the egg that Luther hatched. Luther followed Erasmus's teaching to the end. Erasmus made, uh, as I said, made the way, but Luther was the one that capitalised on him. So his boldness, I showed, in commenting on the ills of Christian society, popes who, in their warlike ambition, imitated Caesar rather than Christ, princes who hauled whole nations into war to avenge a personal slight, preachers who looked to their own interests by pronouncing the prince's war just or by nurturing superstitious. To remedy these evils, Erasmus looked to education, in particular the training of preachers. There were months in which Mer Erasmus thought he saw the world growing young again. He had that optimistic look, the world growing young again. And the full measure of his optimism is expressed in one of his writings on the New Testament. If the gospel were fully preached, the Christian people would be spared in many, way, many wars. Erasmus' home base was in Brabant, and he had influential people there, especially John Savage. Through Savage, he was named honorary counsellor to the 16-year-old Archduke Charles, the future Charles V, and was commissioned to write The Education of a Christian Prince. These works express Erasmus' own conviction, but they also did no harm to Savage's faction at court, which wanted to promote the reform of the church. Then he went to France, where he met Jean Voirier. The Franciscan told him that monasticism was a life more for fatuous men than of religious men. What does fatuous mean? Fatuous means silly, not of much comment, not, not very serious men. He, but it was here he wrote, again, against the chivalry costume, he wrote the handbook of a Christian knight, how to be a Christian knight. Erasmus was not suited to a courtier's life, nor did things improve when the bishop was induced to send him to the University of Paris. He was asked to go to, um, he was asked to go to, the Diet of Augsburg, where the Protestant confession was made, but he didn't want to go. He always earned and kept his leg on both camps, the Reform camp that Luther was on and the Catholic camp. He left Brabant because he felt if he was there, the emperor would make him write a book against Luther, and he did not want to do that. So that's his place in early modern history. He quit Brabant for Basel on December 1521. He did so lest he be faced with a personal request from the emperor to write a book against Luther, which he could not have refused. Erasmus' belief in the unity of the church was fundamental, but he also didn't believe in Luther's predestination and lack of free will. And you've more than enough on that now to write about Erasmus. <laughs>